I'm Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York. I'm in the studio where Robert Beverly Hale taught figure drawing and artistic anatomy. You're now going to see lecture number four on the foot. Try to get that skeleton out of people's views. <coughs> way back, we put it. Oh, back, back this way. That's it. That's pretty good, I think. You see over there all right? I don't know. That's what worries me. Don't take it too far away because I couldn't get down. I don't. You push the corner up. Man. Put the corner up in here. Put the corner up in here. Oh, well, that's fine. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, that's fine. That's fine. Now they can see you, I think. <coughs> Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, Well, tonight we're going to take up the foot, which is down here. Uh, the problem, the anatomical problem of the hand is first an under, of the foot, I mean, first an understanding of the bones, and then an understanding of what we call the short muscles of the foot, and finally an understanding of the tendons that come down from up here and go over the foot. Uh, the, uh, the foot and the hand uh, have all kinds of analogies. If you know one, you pretty much know the other. Uh, for instance, uh, hand is hard, so is the foot. Well, that means for shape you have to study bones. Uh, as for muscles, we have a short muscle here that artists call the abductor of the little finger and you pull on a muscle and it abducts the little finger you see and uh, makes this bump here and uh, so we try to learn things like that uh, artist in a way I think regard the foot in terms of its two bone systems the ankle system and the heel system uh, uh, the ankle system is this uh, group of bones here and the heel system you know goes underneath it and always touches the ground and is here so when I draw the foot tonight I guess I'll draw the left one when I draw this foot uh, let's make what they used to call an exploded drawing at first we'll draw this bone here which is called the astragalus this one here, the navicular, and these cuneiforms, and these metatarsals, and finally these toes. And then we'll draw the heel system. Uh, and we take each bone up separately, and as they say, explode the foot. Uh, this top bone on which the tibia rests is called the astragalus. The old term is talus, astragalus, so they call it, the doctors. Well, we want to get shapes, you see. That's what we're primarily interested in, is the shape of things. Because, frankly, in illusionary drawing, we can't draw anything unless we have a shape conception. You see, that's why it's so odd for people to draw this uh, body when half the forms of the body, they're not even aware that they exist, you know. Laymen are not aware of, uh, oh, I suppose, 87% of the forms that artists draw in this body. And uh, yet they take a try. The astragalus, or talus bone, uh, I think the way to uh, start these things off is to think in terms of simple geometric conceptions like uh, blocks, 
and uh, cylinders and ovoids, egg-like shapes, spheres, and then other ones that strike your fantasy. Th these are the uh, recognized formal ones, but artists use lots of others. Uh, spool, very nice one. The donut, very nice one. Any that strike your fancy, because drawing to a great extent is running lines over conceived forms, and these are very often the conceived forms. They also illustrate all the planes in the body. Uh, how about the, the uh, convex, concave plane? That shows up according, uh, occasionally. It's the skin of that thing, you see. Can you shade a spool? Because if you should, could, you could shave, of course, a concave, convex plane of that sort. Well, uh, that all has to do with general drawing. I'm supposed to lecture on anatomy. Uh, the astragalus bone isn't just a something, you know, the way it is for the layman. Uh, we have to get a shape. So we think in terms of these things, and if you think of a spool, with a little cylinder coming out of it, uh, you have your first shape conception, which you can then refine the rest of your life, to your heart's content. But it's better than no shape at all, you see. That then goes into this bone here, which is called the navicula. Uh, that means ship, but it's really, it's really much more like a, a half cylinder, uh, a little high on the inside. It's this sort of a bone. Uh, that goes into the three cuneiform bones that come underneath here. Uh, there's a case where the term describes the bone to a great extent. Those of you who are used to cuneiform writing. Uh, but actually, I think the best way to think of them is like, you know that camembert cheese you buy and it's all wrapped up in little tin foil pieces? Uh, they're a lot like that. Things like this. The one for the big toe is the biggest. This is quite a small one. Uh, this is a little larger here. Uh, I would say, after some reflection, uh, that I would not consider that part of the ankle system. I'd consider it part of the heel system. Now, we then want run into the uh, metatarsals. This is the tarsus, you know, this group of bones. Meta means beyond. And these are all metatarsals. On the hand, we have the carpus and the metacarpals, you see. So it's a lot the same. The average feel, I think, uh, as a start, for all the metatarsals and all the metacarpals is a box and a rod and a ball. So we can start off with a really very large box on the... Uh, great toe, and it comes down with curious concave qualities and ends up in a ball underneath. Uh, it's quite important when you study the feet and the hands to realize that these balls on the end are underneath, you see. You don't feel them on the top. You see them here, you see, making a big impression. But they're not on top. You see them if you do that, those are your knuckles. Uh, most people don't know their feet have knuckles, but just pull your toes in like that, you'll see the knuckles of your toes. Then we have the metatarsal of the second, which is more ball-like, uh, more box-like, uh, with its uh, convex movement to the top and the uh, ball on the bottom. Then we have the toes down here, the... Uh, the uh, 
great, great toe would have two phalanges, and the uh, final one would have the ever-present ever arrowhead, which is on the end of all your fingers and toes to support your nail. The uh, other toes, the bones are so uh, amorphous or vestigious or not very clear uh, that we really think more of their direction. Perhaps just cylinders are good enough. Uh, they, uh, well, we'll see, we'll see them rather clearly on the side view. Uh, but the direction of the bones of the, of the other toes seems to me make the toes. Well, that is the ankle system. <coughs> uh, the astragalus, the navicula, the three cuneiforms, usually called inner, middle, and outer. The uh, metatarsal of the great toe, and I've rather stressed the concave quality it has on many views. It's one of the strong little concave lines of the body that an artist can use to affect, especially on uh, three-fourths views of this sort. Uh, I... I uh, It's uh, convex on the profile, but it's terribly subtle. <coughs> and then a couple of uh, phalanges, as they're called, on that one. Three on this, just like the hand. You have two phalanges here, three on the others. And that's your ankle system. Now, under that, and coming out over here, is the heel system, but I can't draw it that way because you couldn't see it. So I'll draw it separately over to the left. And uh, that starts off with the heel bone. Yeah, it, uh, it's rather hard to give a very simple feeling for that. I suppose it's sort of a, a block coming towards you, more curved than anything else, uh, rising up a bit. Uh, the important detail on that is a platform up here which will support this bone. Uh, that has the most terrible name in anatomy. That's called a sustentaculum tali. That means the sustainer of the tallest bone, which is actually the astragalus, you see. Uh, you can see that all these things are here. I should have shown them. Now, we got this bone here called the cuboid. Uh, the cuboid, the name gives it away pretty much. It's a cube-like thing, but it has actually three facets we have to think of. Uh, to receive the two uh, metatarsals and uh, to partially receive this thing. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, this one here, which... Uh, would be about here in the in the field. Uh, that's the metatarsal of the third toe. Uh, metatarsal of the fourth. Uh, the metatarsal of the little toe is very famous for a big bump on its beginning, just like the hand, you know. Uh, there they all are, a few toes out here for good luck. Uh, little toe rides high. The heel bone or oscalcis, the cuboid, uh, these three matter tarsals are undoubtedly, in my mind, for the artist, belong to the uh, heel system. And a few toes out here. Now, that's the skeleton of the foot. Now, as I say, the shape of the foot depends on your knowledge of the shape of these individual bones. Uh, we might uh, put a foot together right side or left side or something. We arrange the bones so we can get a little feel for them and we put it in an odd position. Uh, you can put it into uh, into cubes if you wish. And it's not a bad idea for perspective and landmarks. About three cubes. Uh, maybe they're about the size of the cube of the knee, if you can think that way. 
Maybe they're, maybe they're about uh, half the width of a head, but a little more. Uh, we're on the uh, outside of the left foot. Now, under the foot is all kinds of padding, as I probably told you. Uh, so that we won't get shocked, you know, when we come down suddenly. Uh, the padding in the body, I probably told you about, but it is always interesting to me. Uh, the foot is heavily padded at the bottom. Uh, there's a good deal of padding in here. Uh, then you can see all these pads here. All the way up, you see. Uh, so by the time you get to your brain, which is possibly the most important thing you have, it gets this beautiful sort of Cadillac ride, you see. You know, I come down like this, I don't get a terrible shock up here. Uh, uh, that's uh, part of the reason for all that padding. Well, that heel bone would be in here, uh, and it rises immediately, and then it has that platform jutting out towards you. On top of the platform sits the astragalus, you see, of the ankle system, which is nothing but a spool with a neck coming out of it. But look where the neck comes to, if you're able to think in terms of uh, a block-like masses. Oh, they're memory aids, of course, and uh, perspective aids. That would then, let's run down the ankle system, that would touch the navicula, uh, which juts out quite a lot. Artists pick that up, you know, they pick up this thing here, that's the sustentaculum tali. Then we take the cuneiforms, the uh, nearest one is very overwhelming, and in my book just hits about halfway there. <coughs> And then we take a, a, a ride down the metatarsal of the great toe. And the ball is about here. And the toe is here, it doesn't quite... The, uh, the classical idea is that the second toe is the longest. It uh, varies, you know. You can look at your feet tonight at leisure. Uh, but it varies. Uh, I, I suppose it's a racial characteristic. Uh, the, the Scotch are said to have always longer second toes. Uh, uh, then if we're down to the ground, we look past this and we'll see this one, the second cuneiform. It's on the high line and that fascinates us. And immediately this uh, second metatarsal takes over and starts down to the ground and then disappears behind the other. Now, that's your ankle system. The heel system starts with the heel. Uh, we pick up the cuboid way over there on the other side. It must go about to here. And, uh, oh, we could see, of course, some uh, metatarsals coming down. <laughs> <clears throat> but the one to note is the metatarsal of the little toe, which is about here with this big bump. And uh, the ball would arrive on this side of that block, of that block, you see. Uh, if you want to play with feet, uh, you can figure out where all these balls on the bottom of the uh, foot fall. Oh, that is supposing you drew a plan. See, I don't think people know how to draw uh, forms unless they uh, know about plan, elevation, and section. They certainly never can do perspective as long as they live unless they understand what those terms mean. Well, the foot as a whole is really, you can feel the arch, you see. It's designed by engineers. It, it's, it's an arch. And uh, got a few old toes out here, as I said, but mortised into the arch, that means firmly fixed, is a spool, you see. And the great weight of the tibia comes down and sits on that spool. 
allowing, of course, the patient to stand up on his toes, stand up on his heel. That's the principal action of the foot. See, I can go up my toes, up on my heels. But, of course, the foot is more subtle than that because we have to walk over uneven ground, as I think I said last time. Uh, so it has to have additional motions. Uh, the joint is loose. There is a rotation there, down there. There is inversion, there is eversion. And of course, as I explained last time, that we muscle uh, tendons take care of all those things. But that's your principal action, going up on your toes and up on your heels. Uh, so we can bring down the uh, tibia and put it on the spool, uh, but in actuality, of course, this outside of the tibia slops over, slops over the spool in order to prevent what doctors would call medial displacement, to prevent the foot from flying out and hitting you in the face, is, I suppose, what the layman would say. Uh, on the other side, you see, that's taken care of by this long fibula. That stops the foot from jumping out this way. That's the function of the fibula down here. Uh, well, let's draw the outside view. <coughs> and we can use the same as three old boxes. <coughs> three good transparent cubes is what they are. Uh, we see the heel bone here as much this. Oh, it's here, of course. Uh, yeah. Heel bone there. It, it rises, I say, rather abruptly. It has a little platform up here uh, and continues about to there. And, of course, that spool sits on top of it, you see, with its little neck. Now, this cuboid would be here and on this facet of the cuboid goes the great big bump of the metatarsal of the little toe. The, uh, as the doctors would say, the proximal end. And I'm drawing it as if you were standing on the ground because when you stand on the ground the uh, little toe is very horizontal to the ground, the metatarsal of the little toe. Uh, the metatarsal of the next toe would start a little higher and go a little further. In fact, I do believe the ball just about splits that line. And the next one about the same. Oh, oh, I forgot the... Uh, well, I haven't got to them yet. <coughs> these, uh, these bones here... Uh, the navicular, you see, I put on. I'm doing both systems at once, probably bad teaching. And I put these cuneiforms on from this side. You see the top one. The uh, next one be a little further back. And the other metatarsal will come down. And now we're on the second. We'll find that's the longest. Probably about to here. Now, if we're right down on the ground, we'll see the enormous metatarsal of the great toe uh, beyond, and the great toe beyond, too. <coughs> Whereas the toes here, the, uh, the, the movement of the toe in these pictures is up and horizontal and down and out. The bone is breaking there. Now, uh, that's the little arrowhead. Uh, in other words, the feel of the toe is a up, an horizontal, and then a down and forward. They keep getting shorter. <coughs> and the little toe likes to ride high, just normally. The little toe rides high. Uh... Well, I don't know if you know all we want these names again. Here's the heel bone. Or, uh, here's the astragalus with its neck. There's the navicular, and here are a couple of uh, these things. They sort of mold down there into the cuboid. 
making an arch. And the various metatarsals and the few toes, you have a foot. Uh, bring the tibia down. It's got a couple of bumps here on each side, like that. And they're there, of course, to secure the fibula, you see, which sits in there and prevents lateral displacement. You see, there's the fibula. The foot won't fly out now, you see. Uh, the tibia and fibula are well bound together. They're practically one bone. Uh, those are pretty much the facts. If you can memorize them, you could almost draw a foot in any position. Perhaps you'd have to draw a plan. But I thought <coughs> we might draw a foot in some crazy position to show you how artists think in terms of blocking. In fact, let's take this position. We often, so often see the foot on a front figure, especially from, in fact, they're a little above it usually. Uh, let's think of three cubes like this, coming down this way. That might make about a cube. something like that. Uh, you see our points are all indicated here pretty much. <clears throat> Not altogether though, we'd have to have a plan. <clears throat> that spool there, uh, goody way it is here, that spool would just touch the top of the box about here. And uh, the little neck would come out of it I'd come forward and touch the front plane of this last box. Might be about that in feeling. And on that would go this somewhat jutting out navicular. And then the cuneiforms. Great big one for the big toe. A little smaller for the second toe. And uh, the second toe is intimately related to the cuboid. If you look under a foot, you'll see that. This one here. Then <clears throat> down comes the metatarsal of the great toe with a slight uh, concave feel. You see me seeing through the box to see where the ball will be. Of course, I have to raise myself from the floor a little of the block. See the concave feeling? Uh, that would have a, uh, a big toe on it. Uh, really, the, the big toe itself, one of the masses of the foot, when you get the flesh on it, the nail would be about here, I suppose. Uh, here comes the second, which is tucked into a little valley there. Now, these uh, metatarsals all splay or fan. <coughs> See the movement of the first up, horizontal, to the ground, down, and out for the last. Uh, now let's try the heel system. Oh, I took it away, didn't I? Heel system. We see it right along here. Uh, the heels start about there on the back of the box. And it would have its platform to hold the uh, astragalus. And we wouldn't see much of it over here. 
Uh, and we wouldn't see too much cuboid either. And now we can bring down the third uh, metatarsal, making it splay and having figured out about where it ends. And finally the fourth, And finally, the metatarsus is a little toe, uh, which will have an enormous uh, bump on its uh, proximal end, and will come along very close there, and the toes come out. And the little toe, uh, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, run, rides high. The uh, great uh, tibia comes down, slops over the inside, square it up always, get the feeling of squaring up, it's a great trick, fits into that ball. And we might perhaps just see the fibula beyond there. And that way we get a foot. Uh, there's several uh, ideas we can get out of that. Uh, you might take a croquet wicket in your mind and put it up here on the lawn over the metatarsal arch there. Uh, you've got uh, something like that. And then down on the lawn here, where the <coughs> metatarsals end, you can draw a line like that. Then you'll say the metatarsal of the great toe starts about here and goes down to the lawn. The second is the highest. Uh, the next a little lower, and the next a little lower. They're all fanning, you see. And the last one with a big bump, uh, theoretically, lies on the lawn itself. Uh, it, it really does lie horizontal to the ground. You put a lot of weight to it. Uh, that gives you the feeling of what they call the dorsum of the foot, that feel there. Uh, another thing you see quite clearly from this skeleton would be the, uh, the, ankle, the ankle and heel system the ankle and heel system. Uh, you see, you can think, well, this is an ankle system here. Uh, it comes down and uh, it owns uh, a couple of toes, the big toe and, and another one, and uh, probably longer. And the heel system is a mass that goes underneath, you see, like that. And it comes out on the other side and uh, has three toes. And when you draw a foot, you always, on this position, you always shove the heel system under the ankle system and the uh, the uh, flesh and muscles are so arranged that that is really pretty true oh some people like to say that uh, that if, if you take a salad bowl, you take a salad bowl, you know, and you just cut it in two, like that, cut it in two, that uh, the foot's a good deal like that, that the outside of the foot, you see, is always on the ground, but this arch here is here. Of course, there are a few toes added, but nobody much cares about them, except... Uh, mothers with babies. Uh, you know, they're always saying this little pigment of argument or something, but 
For artists, toes aren't so terribly important. I'll tell you one thing artists ought to do. Don't make them too dull. They usually look dull. Uh, but give them a little, you know, change them a little. Put a little life in them. Make one a little higher than the other or something. Don't just run them off the way you see them all the time. Well, it's later than I thought. Uh, I apologize. I must have been late. I see my watch was five minutes late. And that was the reason. But let's have a little recess, and I'll come back and put on the short muscles. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, now for the short muscles of the foot. Uh, there aren't many, they're not too hard to learn. But they have a great influence on the shape. Uh, there is a muscle that abducts the little toe. And it's very odd because it has two bellies with a tendon in between. Uh, this is the little toe side and the muscle has uh, a belly and a tendon and a little second belly and then a tendon that goes into the little toe. Uh, that's tucked up against the bone here, you see. There's the first belly. Uh, the tendon goes over that landmark of ours, the bump on the metatarsal, and then the second belly appears. And then a little tendon goes a little toe in order to pull it out. That's why it's called an abductor, because to abduct is to kidnap or take away from home. We can put some red on it. The abductor of the little toe. Uh, you feel that all the time when you draw the outside of a foot. If you draw the outside of the foot, you come down on the heel, you see, and then you take a ride on that muscle, and you get that little accent. And then you change angle. You change angle when you draw the outside of a foot. And the little toe is here, riding high. And the other side comes down its own way, as we'll see. Uh, also, perhaps we ought to look at a footstep because, you know, many views of the foot that seem hard are nothing but a footstep in perspective. Uh, a good way to draw the footstep is to practice it with four cubes, with three cubes, and run a line down the center. Because you run right away into quite a remarkable thing that people don't seem to notice. Uh, and that is that the heel is just half as wide here it's just half as wide as the great spread here. You see, then the footstep mo moves along this way, and we get that little bump about there, and then it comes way out to there. And we get the bump for the little toe itself, the metatarsal, uh, probably the imprint of the little toe. And then it all depends how hard you stand on the ground, uh, the width of that there. Uh, but pretty soon you run into a great big mass here, uh, which is made up of these three balls you see underneath there. Now that, of course, is the imprint of the heel system. Uh, I don't know, if I were just starting to draw, I'd walk around the bathroom in my bare feet. And, oh, I might take a bath first and, and uh, look at my footstep, you know. Uh, now, you see the uh, ankle system is on top and comes down, and it leaves its imprint about here. Uh, that's this uh, great, uh, the, the two great balls in there, you see, the ball of the, uh, of the great toe is in there, and it's uh, companion. Uh, that's why I went through all this nonsense here. <clears throat> because I think it's very clear that when you look at the footstep, that that is heel system. The, uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, ball of the third metatarsal. And then the toes out here would leave their imprints uh, according to their size and shape and everything. But I think the important lesson is how narrow the ankle is. Most people don't seem to realize that uh, compared to the wideness of the foot. Uh, of course, if you're starting to draw, for heaven's sakes, uh, 
match your foot against some other part of the body, <coughs> um, all beginners make enormous feet from any point of view. But uh, your, your foot, uh, your foot's not very wide down here, you know. It's, uh, it's probably about as wide when it's pressed on the ground as the flesh knee would be. Uh, heaven knows in this one, if we took the length or uh, the width of this bone here, uh, we'd find it was just about comparable to the width across here, you see. But I think when you stand on the foot, it gets a touch wider. But uh, try to remember your feet are not very big when you draw these poor models. Uh, and always remember that as a baby, you could put your foot in your mouth. And if you only did a little yoga, you still could, without doubt, uh, and practically get it in there, you know. It's not, it's not as big as you think, nor are the hands. Beginners always make enormous hands. That same rule, you see, you can apply to the hands. <laughs> well, he seems stubborn. We'll take the right hand here. <laughs> that same rule you can apply to the hands. <clears throat> if you can get in the habit of measuring from the point of view of the skeleton, uh, you've made a great uh, stride forward. You see, that's practically the same. Uh, my feeling is a little more here. And then there are other factors that come in. Uh, you can move this bone in here, the metacarpal, and this one here. <coughs> you can do the same thing on the foot. Uh, so the body of the hand and foot may change size, uh, but as soon as you get aware of where the movement is, you see on the foot there's movement in here, and there's movement in there. Uh, but otherwise, the whole body of the foot down to the toes, uh, uh, artists should think of it as one form. Uh, students have a terrible habit of breaking a foot, something like that. Uh, they draw feet like this. Uh, you feel that they've broken it right across there, but you can't do that. There's a little movement in there for the doctors, but awfully little. And hardly enough for the artist of uh, bone against bone. Well, this uh, double muscle there, we'd, uh, we'd catch a little of it in this view. You see this box I drew, if you'll only draw them when you're a student, you don't have to draw them anymore, you imagine. Uh, but you certainly, you use the lines and take rides on them all the time, you know. You take rides on the width line, on the height line, on the depth line, all the time when you draw if you can think in terms of mass and blocking. If you can't, you never can throw your figure into perspective anyway. So uh, those of you who are after illusionistic drawing will have to take that problem up seriously. Uh, that little red belly here, the second one, we, we'd see here if the, uh, the pressure of the weight of the body would push it out a bit there. Now, we have just the same thing on the other side, an abductor of the great toe. Uh, it's a long, uh, it fits in here, you see. It's a, sort of a long uh, sausage-like muscle, though it has a little quality of its own. A uh, little like that, with a tendon on it. And it's pushed up against the heel bone there. <coughs> pushed up against the heel bone. And it has a process that goes up to the sustentaculum. And it comes down here. And perhaps its greatest effect is that it softens the bony outline that you'd see otherwise. I think again and again in anatomy, we think of matters like that. There is a tendon on the hand here, that carries a beautiful flow from here to there. Uh, well, the bony outline is very jagged inside there, you know. But it seems like just one flow by the time you learn about the tendon. And the same is true of this muscle here. It, it softens this bony outline. Uh, artists occasionally pick off the sustentaculum tali and the uh, protuberance of the uh, navicular here. But not much else. On uh, this figure, 
the uh, heel comes down and you always feel you're shooting the heel in under the instep. And then you pick up the inset on that muscle and bring it down and send the tendon into the great toe so that it will abduct the great toe and pull it that way. Now, there are two short muscles. We have one other that artists uh, study, but it's a group. <clears throat> it's the group of short extensors of the toes. You see in the uh, skeleton, there's quite a hollow here, just about large enough to put a small mouse right there. But on the flesh foot, there's an egg-like shape there. And that egg-like shape is made up of the short extensors of the toes. Uh, actually, there are four of them. And uh, they have uh, tendons on them that go down to the toes. <clears throat> and they're all collected together in an egg-like shape that you'll see here on your foot. Fits right in there. That's the group of the short extensors of the toes. Uh, keep an eye on that as you study the great drawings. The artists love it. Oh, say Blake, you know, that genius, who drew so very anatomically. Uh, or, usually, his friend and master, a Swiss. Uh, But I think those are the three that artists know. The abductor of the little toe, the abductor of the great toe, and finally, the group of the short extensors. And that brings us into a complex subject, and that is the lower leg and its muscles and the tendons that flow from them over the foot. Uh, you see, artists like tendons over hands and feet these things here and the others on the feet, because any line over form will not only give the illusion of the shape of the form, but the direction of the form, you see? So they study these matters. And I guess if we study them, we'll have to draw a great big leg someplace. Let's try it over here. And we get one or two principles, too, if we do this. <coughs> Uh, let's go back a ways into the pelvis. And we could easily draw a block. We could maybe imagine another one on top of it. And we'd get uh, the perspective pelvic block from the side. Uh, some of you remember these things, the pelvic point. You see, these are landmarks, the wide point. High point, the sacrum, the symphysis pubis. You see me using a draftsman's trip trick. I want to get the point of the ischium. I run a vertical of the mass. You know that vertical re would remain, uh, they'd call it a height line. It would remain a height line regardless of the position of the mass. It's, it's rather hard to explain all that. It has to do with what they call the anatomical position. Uh, doctors think of the figure this way, as I probably told you. A rather dull way to think of it, but uh, that's what they do. And everything in front is in front, and everything on the outside is the outside, and everything in the back is the back. So it doesn't matter what position the figure takes, you see. They say that's the width line. That's the height line, you see. Any form. Uh, in fact, you can't understand the word aspect unless you understand that. Because, you see, for the artist, aspect has to do with the tilt of the height axis. 
and the amount of vertical rotation around the height axis. Uh, I tilt my head like that, you see the height axis is going this way, and I can rotate the head then, and people would say it's rotated so much around the, around the height axis in relation to reference planes. If you're starting to draw, look up and find out what reference planes are and what drawing systems are. If you feel just like to, just love to draw because you feel that way, I might ask, uh, what drawing system are you using? Are you using uh, orthogonal projection or are you using perspective? Or are you perhaps using military perspective? Are you using cavalier perspective? I mean, aside from your feelings, you know, you're always drawing in one system or another that have been very thoroughly analyzed by the boys in the universities. Uh, it's awfully hard to escape universities. They're always on your neck, you know. Uh, if I have any advice at all to give to our students, that is don't go to any art school that is affiliated with a university. Uh, <laughs> You'll have the professors on your neck in no time of other disciplines, you see, and you won't even be able to be yourself. Uh, well, if we want to draw a uh, pelvic crest here, we take the very outside line, because that's where it comes through. We'll feel the secondary point, the symphysis, pubis, all those things we talked about. <coughs> We'll feel the tuberosity of the ischium. We'll take this famous construction line, and we get the back lip of the acetabulum. And we put the ball in there, and we'll bring out the neck, and we'll feel the great trochanter, and then we can drop the bone. Uh, if you want to, you can drop the bone, three of those things, which are called the five-eyed line, you could drop it two pelvis lengths, which is approximately the same thing. So uh, we could come down here on three. I prefer to take it from the top. And we can say the knee will be here. Then we can take that again. And we could say the floor will be here. Uh, there's a beautiful construction plane, which is simply this. It is on all bodies. You see, in drawing, we have to realize that a line can be a plane seen on end, especially in architectural or orthographic drawing. And for us, too, in perspective, any, uh, any line perpendicular to the face plane would be a, could be a... I mean, uh, any uh, line could be a plane perpendicular to the face plane. Uh, well, this bone comes down, as you remember, from all our talking. Uh, it comes down with a very gentle curve, which is reflected in the front of the thigh. And we see the spool on the bottom from the side. Uh, then we come down here on the tibia, with that beautiful little S-curve. And uh, the fibula would be here. And now we know all the bones of the foot, and we have no trouble putting them in at all. Be about so long. You know, the cuboid and the metatarsal of the little toe and all these things we've been talking about. <clears throat> and we get a foot. Now we might pause to see the way beginners consider the figure to be. Uh, the beginners will draw figures this way when they turn up. The head might be in any position, though they will always cut off the back. They'll put the eye too high, of course. A beginner will give you a straight neck, and then a perfectly vertical rib cage, and then a belly and a buttocks on the same level, and then a vertical thigh, and then he's read the word knee in some great author's book, so he puts in the word knee. He then gives you a calf right below the thigh, and uh, then he gives enormous feet. <laughs> and that's what they do, and they say, I do that because I won't express my strong feelings about people. Uh, well, it's not the way it is, you see. It's not the way it is. And we'll see why at once. <coughs> 
Uh, some of you remember that this great muscle here, rectus abdominis, has to go into the symphysis pubis. So if I'm drawing a belly up here, which is rectus abdominis, I have to drive it there, you see. Uh, they can get fatter, as you know. God knows they can come out to here or something. But no matter what happens, I have to drive the belly there, you see. Now, some of you remember gluteus medius, that muscle up there, which pulls your leg out. But the buttocks muscle comes off the sacrum and breaks at the bottom of this box and goes one-third in down the leg. You see, it's a muscle like that. And, of course, we can't have this vertical to that. I mean horizontal to that. But it's funny, that's done not only beginners, but by primitive races. And in the beginning of almost every art. Uh, I used to think it came from city living, because we live in these cities that are all post and beam, you know, and we see things vertically and horizontally. But the model in the average pose, nothing is ever absolutely horizontal or vertical. Uh, now, we can remember a little anatomy, I guess. We want to draw the hamstring group, which bends the lower leg here. Uh, there's our point. That's the ischium. We know it comes off the ischium and that it's going to go into the head of the fibula, you see, uh, with a strong hamstring. So your hamstring group would just be a line like that from one point to another point, really. It's about all drawing is. Just know where the line is starting, where it ends. You've got a nice line. Of course, you can't tell how fat it's going to be. Uh, that's why it's very hard to block the legs up for uh, fatness purposes, you might say. You can block up the skeleton. Uh, it's very hard to block up the, uh, the skeletons of the arms and the legs, though. You can block up the feet and the hands, and even the fingers. Uh, you can block them to be sure, but you, your blocks won't be accurate because you don't know how fat people will be. It's only skeletal blocks that are very accurate. Here's a patella. Goes into the kneeling point. We want to create a muscle that will pull the lower leg forward. Well, that muscle is called the quadriceps, comes off the second point. Not out of the nipple, but off the second point. And how much it swells, you don't know until you see the model. It goes to the patella in order to perform its function. Uh, then, of course, we have to go up on our toes, a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so we have this enormous muscle here, uh, the calf group. Uh, don't make it too low. And that goes into the Achilles tendon, and that goes uh, down into the uh, heel. That puts you on your toes, you see, that group there with the soleus, the two of them. Uh, then, as I said last time, I hope, we have <clears throat> a group of muscle they often call the perineal group, which uh, dies away about here. And uh, the drawing down here depends on your knowledge of bones and tendons. Now, those uh, facts have brought about a rule that artists use called the straight line rule of the leg. Uh, when the leg is straight, when the leg is straight, you can think of the thigh as a cylinder. You can think of the thigh as a cylinder. <coughs> And you could take the axis of the thigh. That's the central line, you see. Then you can hang another cylinder on the back of that. And then you carve, you see, the, uh, the thigh out of the top cylinder. You carve the thigh out of the top cylinder. And you carve the calf and the bone out of the back cylinder. And you notice, of course, that uh, there isn't anything here at all, though everybody draws it there in the beginning, because the lower leg is very definitely back. The lower leg is definitely back. And uh, 
Uh, uh, this line here I pointed out, uh, you can see it touch the back of that bone there, and it'll come down and it'll touch the back of the tibia. You see, it's really a plane. Uh, it will also, if we carried it up, would touch the back of the ribcage and the back of the head on a good standing figure. Uh, but you can see how different this is from the, uh, the beginner's conception of the belly and the buttocks, the thigh, uh, the knee, and the uh, uh, foot, you see. I mean, you can do that with a beginner's drawing almost invariably. Oh, you get this, you do a little teaching, these ideas. Teaching is a good way, to, uh, not too much, but uh, a little teaching helps you to draw a lot. Well, to trace all these muscles down over the foot, I think we just have time. Uh, I don't think that you can learn all this just from this little lecture. Uh, but there are six muscles in there. We talked about them last time. And they're arranged this way. <clears throat> and then this one here, big one, has a long tendon, and then there's one underneath it. Now, they're all in the books. You can study them to your heart's content. Uh, the bellies are of not very much importance except for the one I joked about last time. Uh, Tibialis antiochus is the first one. You'll often see it in running men. You see, they all, they're all collected in that group there. We call it the perineal group. <coughs> that means pertaining to the fibula. But there isn't any name for it that I've ever found. Uh, the, uh, the muscle tendon is terribly important. It's very important indeed because the tendon comes down and goes all the way to the halfway of the foot. It's one of those things that, of course, no beginner has ever heard of. You see, they draw feet like that, and so do cartoonists for the fun of it. But professionals know that there is a flow down there, you see, as big as your nose, which I think I mentioned last time. That's the tendon of tibialis antiochus. That means the muscle in front of the tibia. <clears throat> now, the next one is called the special extensor of the great toe. Special extensor. I don't believe you can see the Latin. Special extensor of the great toe. Uh, that'll show up well here. Oh, oh, I should put tibialis antiochus on here. It, uh, it'll come down here very strongly and very visibly and go all the way into there. Uh, those of you not aware of it might just flex your foot a bit and feel it and see what a big mass it is there. Uh, of course, it, it shows up much more in flexion than it does in extension. Uh, the next one, <coughs> this one, sometimes just peeks out through here on account of the binding, but it's very strong on the top of the big toe. Uh, again, on the count of the binding, you don't see it through here. That's the special extension of the great toe. It says it's analog here on the thumb, of course. The next one is the special extensor of all the toes. A uh, common extensor, they probably call it in the book. And that sends a tendon down that goes to the end of all the toes. Uh, again, it's bound down there. It appears about here. And, of course, now you have a remarkable chance to tell people about the shape of the dorsum of the foot, you see. If you can feel the line going over the shape. There is a, uh, there's a little uh, uh, quality about that tendon, taking a, uh, a side view like that. If you take an individual metacarpal, you see, it moves that way. And then the toe moves up quite considerably, and then horizontal, and then down and horizontal. 
And of course, the tendon usually goes over that valley. So you watch for that. The next one would be uh, common extension of the toes, perineus tertius, the third perineal. Uh, it uh, shows up very strongly on the side view. <clears throat> it comes from in front of the fibula here and goes into our great landmark, the proximal end of the metatarsal of the little toe. <coughs> Well, you can see it might have a little value in rotation, uh, possibly in uh, flexion. Uh, the next one is perineus longus. We talked about it last time. And uh, that comes down here and goes under that muscle, under the foot, in through the cuboid, and way up on the other side. And uh, doctors think of it as holding the transverse arch in tone. Uh, and indeed it does, if you injure it, uh, you have a lot of foot trouble. Uh, and the last one is uh, perineus brevis, they call it. Uh, that comes down, where is our side view? Uh, that comes down and goes into that same landmark. Uh, in between the two of them is a little tubercle that artists know, the perineal tubercle. Here's Tibialis anticus. Artists fight a lot whether to make it a, uh, a concave there. Uh, artists just hate to use concaves on the body, but uh, uh, some of them are rather insistent. I always feel this is a concave, no matter what they say. But uh, it's fun to look at the masters and see how they disagree on those things. Uh, many concaves, they'll make a, uh, uh, a series of convexes, you know, just to avoid the concave. <coughs> uh, the, the, convex, uh, the concave seems to go a little against living matter and uh, you don't see it very often uh, though it does seem to me that concave, convex is quite prevalent in li uh, living matter and may well turn up on the outline <coughs> well uh, I guess that's the information pretty much uh, people like to know about the masses of the foot uh, you see, this heel here makes a mass, and uh, then there's a great big bump over the uh, proximal end of the metatarsal of the little toe. That makes a mass. Uh, these two bellies uh, create masses on the foot. Uh, it, it often makes me think of the difference between the the layman mother and the artist mother. You see the. The layman mother says, this little pig went to market, this little pig stayed home, this little pig had roast beef, this little pig had none, this one went wee, wee, wee all the way home. If you want your child to be an artist, I would say that to him. If you want your child to be an artist, say, uh, this uh, distal end of the metatarsal of the great toe went to market, don't you see? Uh, this tibialis antiochus stayed home. Uh, this group of the short extensors had roast beef. <laughs> and this uh, proximal end of the metatarsal of the little toe had none. And uh, this second belly of the abductor of the little toe cried, wee, 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 all the way home. Then your child will be an artist because he'll see things in another way, you know. <laughs> the laymen really don't know anything about feet except toes. Uh, and then they have this vague word ankle, but they don't really know what that means. The, but we, uh, we try to go after the truth. I was uh, trying to show you a little of the truth here, as opposed to that, you know. This is more to me more truthful than that. Uh, of course, I don't quite know what the truth is. I, uh, I'm a little taken by, there was a great philosopher called Alfred North Whitehouse, who some of you know about, who was more or less uh, in the same camp with Bertram Russell. And he said, uh, the, the truth is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. Uh, uh, what amused me, I was alive, uh, it wasn't too long ago when he wrote that, and so was Robert Frost. And about six months later, Robert Frost went, came out with a poem, which went, uh, 
We dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. <laughs> and then, rather lately, I've come across an, an amazing phrase by Emily Dickinson, uh, written perhaps a uh, hundred years ago, which goes, Tell the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. Thank you. You've just seen Robert Beverly Hale's lecture number four on the foot, one of his series of ten lectures on figure drawing and artistic anatomy. We hope you'll join us for the next lecture in the series, lecture number five on the shoulder girdle. This is Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York.